and I believe we are officially uh, good to go. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, uh, always within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Kafedzis, a uh, former master's student in Thomas Euler's lab, and uh, relatively speaking, newly arrived PhD student with Tom Baden. As your host for today, I would like to once again begin uh, by thanking Tim Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this very initiative towards a greener uh, and much more accessible uh, seminar world. And of course, having said that, allow me uh, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from University of Sussex, Dr. Sylvia Schroeder. Following a bachelor degree in uh, cognitive sciences from University of Osnabrück, she then moved for her master's and uh, PhD in neural systems and biology to ETH in Zurich, where she worked with Kivan Martin on uh, functionally characterizing neural responses in the primar primary visual cortex of cats. Uh, in 2014, she relocated to UCL in London, where she joined the labs of uh, Matteo Carandini uh, and Kenneth Harris, and there uh, successfully, successively funded by Marie Curie and uh, BBSRC grants, she investigated the effect of behavioral modulation on uh, visual processing uh, by recording either optically with uh, two photon microscopy or electrically with the famous neuropixels, uh, the neural activity at different visual areas. At the beginning of uh, this very year, uh, she moved to Sussex where she is currently uh, setting up her own lab. And without any further ado from my side, it is with great pleasure uh, that I'm leaving the stage for her, Dr. Schroeder, for a talk entitled Arousal Modulates Retinal Activity. The stage is all yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. And thanks also for the invitation to talk here. It's a really a big honor to share my results here and to this big audience. And I'm also hoping to get lots of feedback and comments if people, if people have those. So let me share my screen. Yes, I hope you can see that. Yep, good to go. Good to go. So yeah, today I will talk about how responses in the early visual system, including the output of the retina, are modulated by behavioral or the internal state of the animal. And this is actually what I mean by the term arousal. So it's nothing else but kind of an alerted state or an also a behaviorally active state. And at the center of my talk will be these green fibers that you can see here. These are actually retinal axons coming from the retina to the rest of the brain. Here, for example, the LGN, I believe. But before I go into the results of my studies, I want to provide you with some context. And the, one of the bigger questions that um, these results and these findings address is, you know, the, do we see the world differently when we experience different internal states? So if you look, for example, at these two guys, I hope you can believe me that they're in very different states. So he seems to be quite amazed, surprised by what he's seeing, whatever he is seeing, whereas he seems to be relatively bored. And even if they're looking at the very same thing, the question is, do they see, see it differently? And what do I mean by this? I do not mean that you know, emotions or yeah, internal states can lead to different perceptions or make you um, attend to different things. That's of course also true. But what I mean is, does the eye or other early visual brain areas send different signals to the brain in these two different states? So this idea is not very new, that the idea that internal states influence neural responses even in the early visual system. So about more than 10 years ago now, um, the following was found in the uh, visual neurons. If you have a rodent here on a running wheel, you can see when it's running, like here, uh, also usually the pupil dilates at the same time. And here you can see the activity uh, of multiple units. And you can see that this increases when the animal starts running and also when the pupil dilates, okay? So these findings were originally made in an area called the primary visual cortex. 
And here, just as a reminder, I'm showing you the early visual system. You have here the eye with the retina, which projects directly to the thalamus, to the LGN, also to the superior colliculus, and then the thalamus projects to the visual cortex. So the initial findings that visual responses are modulated by internal state or by locomotion were seen in uh, primary visual cortex. Later on, um, in the last 10 years, people also saw that visual neurons in the superior colliculus are modulated by internal states and arousal, as well as neurons in the LGN, so areas uh, where the retina directly projects to. So having seen all this, we were asking, is this modulation already happening in the retina? Okay, so this is what this talk is mainly about. Now, the first problem is actually measuring retinal activity in an awake animal, in an awake mouse. So we came up with a trick. Um, instead of recording the activity in the eye from the retinal ganglion cells directly, which is difficult because the eyes are moving around, um, we instead record the activity of the axon endings in the rest of the brain, in this case, in the superior colliculus. So we, we can basically image this area and see the activity of those axons. You may wonder whether it is a good choice to go to a superior colliculus. And that's why I'm showing you this, um, this diagram here. Um, all you have to take from this is that there are lots of uh, cell types in the retina shown down here. And the retina projects to a lot of areas in the brain, but here this one shows you the superior colliculus SC, and you can see that most of the cell types and actually also most of the retinal ganglion cells, I think the estimation is around 80 to 90 percent of retinal ganglion cells are projecting to the superior colliculus, so we can actually see a very good portion of the, the retinal output in the superior colliculus. Right, so how do we do this exactly? So we do inject a calcium indicator into the eye. This is called Cygcam 6F. It works like Gcam 6F, so basically gets uh, fluorescent when the, the neurons are active, but it is co-located to the synapses only. So you get the, the output, the fluorescence, mainly at the synapses, okay? And then we have a window at the at the, uh, on top of the brain of the mouse and can image the activity. As you can see in this picture here, showing you the retinal terminals in the superior colliculus, you can actually see that superior colliculus is covered by the cortex. And that's true for most of superior colliculus, um, except the very posterior part. Okay, And this is actually the part we accessed because we did not want to disturb um, any other brain area. So we put our recording window right at the, at the back of the cortex. And this is what we can see um, once we have this um, window in place. So here anteriorly, you can see the superior colliculus. So it's a very specific portion of the superior colliculus. Here you can actually already see the inferior colliculus. So once we have this in place, we can then image using two photon imaging, um, the activity of the retinal axons. And we do this by imaging multiple planes, as you can see here. Um, and these planes, we position them very close to each other, about two microns, because the problem is that the brain is moving, especially when the animal is, is moving, is running, for example. And the retinal boutons are very small structures. So it could be that the brain and the retinal axons are moving in and out of the imaging plane. So in order to track single ex um, retinal axons, we have this volume here. And if the brain is moving, we can then um, post hoc um, track the single axons through this volume. Okay, and just to show you what uh, the data looks uh, look like, 
um, afterwards. So here, um, what we presented to the mouse are these kinds of grating stimuli. They're presented on three monitors. So this is what you can see here. And these gratings are drifting. And you, I will start uh, this movie in a bit. So you will see single trial um, data in this movie. Whenever the grating is on, you will see an arrow appearing here in this corner and it will show you in which direction the grating is moving. Okay. So let me start, start the video. Yeah, I hope you can see this okay. Um, so you can see often quite strong off responses of the, of the boutons. So they light up as soon as the gratings uh, come off. But uh, if you look closer or at other um, boutons, you can also see that they're tuned to very um, certain directions of the stimulus. Okay. So this is data, um, this is sped up 10 times and it is kind of smooth in time and, uh, um, and it shows you the data after aligning an X, Y, and Z. Okay. So in addition to this neural data, we then also recorded um, the behavior of the mouse or the arousal state. And we do this with two measures. One is the running speed. So as you can see here in our setups, the mouse, the mice are always head fixed, but they are sitting on either this, um, ball that is floating on air or on a treadmill that can rotate um, into one direction. And yeah, the animals also surrounded by these three monitors. So we are just recording how quickly the mouse is running and it's free to run in these um, in our studies whenever it wants to. And as a second measure, we are looking at the pupil size. So we have a video of, of the eyes and you can see here quite clearly that the pupil is changing in size quite a bit. And uh, if the pupil is large, we are taking this as a measure of high arousal when it's small, it uh, shows that the, the animal is in a state of uh, low arousal. Right, and now we are coming to the data. Um, so let me just switch on the laser pointer again, yeah. So these data, this data set here was collected in darkness. So the mouse is in complete darkness, but it is free to run. And here you can see this running trace going up and down. In this case, we could actually only measure the running and not the pupil because in darkness, the pupil is, in our case was fully dilated. So we couldn't actually track any changes in size. And here's what the, what the recordings from the retinal axons look like. So here is one data set and each little row, each line of this plot here shows you the activity of one single bouton. And so we have about 300 or so boutons and they're sorted according to whether, or yeah, how positively and how negatively they're correlated with running. So on top you see they're positively correlated with running. At the bottom they're negatively correlated. And here you just see um, two boutons that occurred in this data set just as, um, as a single trace. Okay, so this shows you that in darkness, the activity of the retinal boutons are modulated by the behavior. And this cannot be driven by any visual input because the animal is in darkness. So then we recorded from the same uh, retinal boutons, but showed them visual stimuli. So these same gratings that you've seen before. Now we can also measure the pupil. And you can see that the results are quite similar. So actually I should tell you that now we have here the, the gratings. You can see um, the onsets of the grating is marked by these little tick tick marks, and that induces this strong visual response. So that's why you can see this kind of stripey pattern, it's very thin stripes, okay? So that's the visual response. But even on top of this strong visual response is the modulation by behavior. So again, when the mouse is running, um, these boutons are upmodulated, so the responses are stronger, whereas the boutons down here have a have a reduced response, okay? And again, these are two examples, um, yeah, 
the same bootholes when we showed the gratings, okay? So what you can take away from this, that even when the bootholes are strongly driven by visual input, you still have this modul behavioral modulation, okay? And now comes kind of the quantification of this using all the data we had recorded. And the first plots show you that uh, the effects are heterogeneous, meaning um, arousal induces positive correlations in about half of the boutons and negative correlations in the other half of the boutons. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether this is in darkness or whether you show gratings. Okay, this, you can see this here in this histogram. Um, the, uh, the black bars show you when the correlations were significant and the white bars when the correlations were insignificant. And the whole, um, this whole histogram, this whole distribution was significantly different from what you would expect by chance, which is shown here by this um, gray shade. And the same, basically, you can see here for the gradings. Now you can, we can also compare this more directly. We can plot the correlation for each bouton um, during darkness here on the x-axis and during gratings on the y-axis, and you see there is a strong correlation. It is not exactly the same, so there are some things are different, but the main message here is that the effects are very similar whether you have, whether you do have visual stimulation or you don't have visual stimulation like in darkness. And you probably already realize that I'm kind of switching between running and pupil size, we kind of treat it as more or less one and the same measure of arousal. This is because these two measures are highly correlated as shown here. So there is a very strong relation between pupil size here on the x-axis and running speed on the y-axis. Now, if you look at the correlation values of the single boutons, like here on the axis, you can see correlation with running on the y-axis correlation with pupil, this relationship is, seems even stronger. Um, so the similarity of these correlation measures is, is very strong, even stronger maybe than the similarity between pupil and running. Okay, so that's why we didn't try and figure out what the difference exactly is between running and pupil size. Right, so this was kind of the first um, result showing that there is some modulation. And now we are looking a bit closer at um, what the effects are for different stimuli, particularly for different uh, movements of directions for the gratings. So here we uh, took um, the pupil size as one measure and we divided the data into those where the pupil was small and those where the pupil was large. And here you can see um, tuning curves for one single retinal bouton. In black, you can see the direction tuning curve for small pupil and in red for large pupil. And you can see for this bouton that the response um, decreased when arousal was high or when the pupil was larger. The same, or for this uh, bouton, it was similar. So for the preferred direction, the responses went down with arousal. But for other stimuli, so for those that were non-preferred, responses went actually up. So it shows you that there seems to be some kind of um, selectivity or difference between stimuli. So the effect of arousal can be different depending on the stimulus. But overall, we also see that the preferred direction is not affected. So here we have preferred direction when the pupil is small, when the pupil is large on the y-axis. And you see most of the dots fall on the diagonal showing that this is not changed. But if we then focus on the responses at the preferred direction and look at how uh, the response is modulated during arousal, which is shown here, you see the modulation is mostly negative, meaning for most of the boutons, not all, but for most of them, the response goes down, okay? So at the preferred direction, mostly responses are suppressed. And this was very surprising to us, mostly because in other visual areas, specifically um, primary visual cortex, 
people mostly saw that the responses go up with arousal, or at least it was kind of 50-50. But we were not the only ones seeing this. There was another group um, who published this last year, um, having a very similar um, setup, but recording the axons of the retina in the LGN. Okay, so they also had the mouse here, uh, head fix and running on a ball, showing them gratings, um, but now they recorded activity in the LGN. So they had to take off the cortex and then they could image this. And this is kind of an example image um, that you can see when you express, like we did GCAM uh, 6F in the retinal axons. And kind of summarizing one of their main results is that um, if you change, well, first of all, if you compare the activity during low arousal states with those in high arousal states, you see mostly the activity goes down. So this was similar to us, um, to our findings. But also very interesting is if you change the spatial frequency, so basically how, how thin or thick the stripes are of the grating, you see that the suppression is different. So for uh, for low spatial frequencies, the suppression is much stronger than for higher spatial frequencies. Okay. Um, so yeah, now we've seen, I've shown you that the activity of retinal boutons is modulated. Um, now we were asking ourselves, what could be the, the possible mechanisms behind this? Okay. And we came up basically with two main hypotheses. One is, and we hadn't considered this when we started um, the recordings, but you have to think about what you're actually measuring, right? You measure, or we measure the activity of retinal axons in the superior colliculus. So you're not only seeing the firing rate of the retinal ganglion cells, but this is modulated in addition by um, presynaptic uh, neuromodulation on those axons, okay? So what we could have seen is that there are neuromodulators, for example, serotonin, um, acting on those retinal um, axons. And this is actually what we are seeing, okay? This is how uh, the retinal axons get modulated. This is one hypothesis. The other one is of course that the modulation is happening in the eye so that somehow the information about the behavioral state of the animal goes back to the eye and modulates the activity the firing rate of the retinal ganglion cells in the retina more directly so one way is by axons coming back from the brain there are very few of those but there are some so this is one possibility uh, this information could reach the retina okay so then we went on and tried to figure out which hypothesis, which hypothesis it is. And we tried to test the, the second hypothesis. And uh, for this, we now switch to EFIS. So we use NeuroPixels probes to record from retinal axons. So again, we, we couldn't figure out how to measure directly from the eye. In, in an awake my, mouse. So we thought the best next thing is trying to record from the axons, which we think should not be affected by neuromodulation hap happening much later at the uh, presynaptic pre site in the superior colliculus, for example, right? So this is our assumption that the, the activity in those axons is not modulated further. So basically what we can see is the firing rate of the retinal ganglion cells without any later neuromodulation. And these are um, results from two of these axons. So again, we recorded this in complete darkness and the mouse was free to run whenever it wanted to. So here in this first trace, you see the running speed of the mouse over I think 40 minutes or so. And at the same time here, you can see the firing rate uh, recorded from one single axon in the optic tract. And you can see 
It's hard to see by eye, but if you look at the cross correlogram of this data, you can see that there is a positive correlation between the running speed and the firing rate of this axon. And it's actually higher, more positive than expected um, by chance, which is shown by this red uh, shade here. And here you see a, a second axon, um, which was recorded Again, you see the running speed of the animal and the firing rate. And again, this one shows a positive correlation, which is significant. So more than you would expect by chance. Okay. Now we managed to record from a total of 25 axons, which is really not a lot, <laughs> given that we use the neural pixels probes, but yeah, you have to remember that the neural, the, sorry, <laughs> the optic tract is a very thin structure and it's also very deep in the brain. So it's quite difficult to hit it. And even if you get there with your, with your probe, you know, you will not um, record from lots of axons because again, axons are very thin and it's kind of hard to, to record from them. It's also very hard to keep a stable recording over time. So we had very stringent, um, how do you say, <laughs> measures to ensure that we have a very stable recording and that we are recording from retinal axons rather than from anything else. So that's why this number is relatively low. Okay. But what you can see here on the x axis is the um, the correlation of each axon with running and on the y-axis is the p-value so every dot that is above this um, uh, 0.5, 0 0.05 p-value is significant okay and these were I mean like um, I forgot nine or so were uh, now I said it wrong of course <laughs> so of course you have to look at the dots below the <laughs> Yes, I get this plot is somewhat confusing. So we have swapped the y-axis here. So the smaller values are um, at the top of the y-axis. So whatever is on top of this dotted line has a very small p-value and is therefore significant. So we found that nine of 25 retinal axons have a significant correlation with running in darkness, okay? So this shows you that the activity of retinal ganglion cells is apparently, some of the retinal ganglion cells are modulated by running, okay? So I, I want to just emphasize that this does support our second hypothesis that somehow information gets to the eye and therefore uh, modulates the activity uh, in the retina directly, but it does not exclude the other hypothesis so in top of this, you can still have modulation acting at the presynaptic site in the superior colliculus. And I think this is very likely to happen anyway, because there are receptors at the presynaptic site and there are uh, neuromodulators projecting in the superior colliculus. So I think it's very likely that both things are happening. Right, so after this, we thought well, how does this affect the neurons that are listening to the retina, so that get input um, from the retina, namely what is happening to the neurons in the, in the superior colliculus postsynaptically? So now we did the, the same thing, but instead of uh, imaging retinal boutons, as in the beginning, we now image the activity from neurons in the superior colliculus, which you can see here. And here's, again, the and the results from one data set, you see pupil um, size in green and the running speed in yellow and uh, several hundreds of neurons. And you clearly see that when we showed the gratings, there's visual input, but on top of this is the modulation by behavior. So again, these neurons were sorted by the strength of correlation with running speed. And this is, um, basically the histogram, or the cumulative histogram of correlation with pupil. In black, you can see those for the superior colliculus neurons or in the superficial layer, so the visual uh, neurons. And in brown, you see the correlate or the distribution for the boutons, 
but you can hardly see the brown line because they're basically on top of each other, meaning the distribution of correlations is very, very similar. Now, again, we looked at how the tuning curves of these neurons are affected, and you can see very similar things as to the retinal boutons. But now we also see quite a few neurons whose activity is upmodulated. So in red, you see the activity during higher levels of arousal. So in this neurons, it is upmodulated. And here you can see the distribution of this response modulation um, to the preferred direction. And you see for the black line, which is for the neurons, that about half of the neurons are upmodulated and half are downmodulated. Whereas for the boutons, um, there is a bias towards a, a decrease, as I have said um, before. Okay, so there are strong similarities, also some differences in how neurons and boutons, retinal boutons are affected. So it doesn't prove that the superior cricular neurons um, inherit this modulation by the boutons, but it does show that it's very similar and probably the effect of that we see in the neuron, uh, that we see in the boutons, also affect the responses in the neurons, okay? Um, one thing that might be slightly confusing is here, especially for the boutons, we saw in that the correlations are kind of 50-50, positive, negative, whereas here, uh, the response modulation is mostly negative. So it's relatively simple here. When we look at the correlation, we really look at the activity along the whole time, right? And how is this correlated? Whereas here, this response modulation only looks at the preferred um, direction. So the response to the preferred direction of motion, okay? So we do not look, we kind of ignore what's happening with the responses to other stimuli. That's why you can actually have this difference. Okay. So overall, we think the, uh, the modulation of retinal boutons and superior cricular neurons are relatively similar. Um, but the other input that the neurons in superior cricular get is from primary visual cortex. And we, we already know that the, these neurons are also heavily modulated by behavior. So now we wondered, is there also an effect from V1 in superior cliclus? Okay. Um, that's why we again recorded now using electrophysiology from superior cliclus. But in one condition, we did nothing to primary visual cortex. And in the other condition, we inactivated primary visual cortex. And we did this using optogenetics. So we expressed um, an opsin in inhibitory neurons and in PV neurons. And then when you shine the blue light on primary visual cortex, these inhibitory neurons get active and therefore um, decrease the activity in the projection neurons that project to the superior cliclus. Okay, so here is now the activity of one example neuron in from the superior cliclus. Here is in the control condition. So you see it's nicely modulated by arousal. The activity goes up. Now, if we inactivate uh, V1, generally the response goes down by quite a bit in this neuron, but the effect uh, from arousal is still there. So still the response is upmodulated, okay? And actually the relative amount of the upmodulation is very similar in both cases. So therefore we concluded that um, this modulation is not inherited from V1. And here's just the quantification for all neurons that we recorded. Um, here again, I showed this response modulation showing what happens to the neurons uh, to the responses to the preferred direction. So here you see many neurons are upmodulated, some are downmodulated, and the same is true even if you uh, inactivate V1. And you can also compare this directly. Um, so here is response modulation during the control condition, and here is when V1 is inactivated. Most of the dots kind of fall on the diagonal, so there's not much difference. Only the black dots actually show a significant difference. However, uh, 
there are also many black dots when V1 is inactivated. So actually showing that the, um, the modulation was bigger when V1 was activated, okay? So overall, I think it shows that uh, V1, the input from V1 cannot explain um, the modulation by arousal in superior clicklets. All right, that's my time. I have 10 minutes. So at this point, I've shown you that um, responses of the retina and also uh, of superior clicklets are modulated by these states, locomotion and arousal. And you may wonder, well, what else does the retina or its output know about? How much else does it know? And what I can, what I want to tell you now, does it does not seem to have access to spatial information, which occurs first in, in primary visual cortex. Okay, so this was a study led by Aman Salim. Um, he had a mouse running through a virtual reality, basically through a corridor, which you can see here. And this corridor had four different landmarks, okay? Basically the first half of the corridor looked exactly the same as the second. So the, this landmark and the third one were exactly the same and the same one, also the, the second and the fourth landmark looked exactly the same. So if a visual neuron purely cared about visual input, the responses of this neuron should look the same during the first and the second half, okay? Now what he found looking, recording from V1 is that some neurons, for some neurons, that is the case. So here the solid gray line shows you the response of one V1 neuron and the dotted line is just a copy of the, the response from the, the, the other corridor basically. And you see for this neuron, the responses look very similar for first and second half. Whereas for this neuron, it's very different. It responds much more in the second half of the, the corridor. And in this neuron, it's exactly the opposite. It responds much more in the first half. So somehow these two neurons care about the spatial location of the mouse, right? Whether it's early in the corridor or late in the corridor. Later on, a study, um, spearheaded by Mika Diamanti, looked at LGN boutons that are coming from LGN to primary visual cortex, and she imaged those boutons. And you can see here the activity of three different LGN boutons. And what you can see, hopefully, is that the responses here for all of these example boutons and also in, in the rest of the population, they were very similar in the first and the second half. Okay, so it seems like any kind of spatial information um, first um, is represented in primary visual cortex and not before. All right, so that just as a, as a side story. Now I want to, to summarize my, the, the results I've shown you. So I've shown you that arousal does modulate uh, retinal output. It can or it does differ across retinal terminals because some were positively, some were negatively inferenced. It's also stimulus dependent. Okay, so for some directions, um, you saw that the response can go down and for others, it can go up even in the same retinal bouton. Um, these effects are even observable in the firing rates of the retinal ganglion cells, which speaks for a modulation at the site of the retina. And arousal also has very similar effects in the postsynaptic neurons, okay? So these are the findings as we, as we have them now. I think, oops, sorry. <laughs> the big open question for me is, what is the computational advantage of this behavioral modulation as early as in the retinal output? And I just want to kind of show you the two, two things I'm kind of thinking about. One is kind of along this idea of predictive coding and retina already does predictive coding amazingly. So what do I mean by this? So if you look at natural stimuli like this one, and you can also imagine how this moves along, 
um, there are lots of correlations in space and in time. And the retina is clever enough to compress this information by encoding only those features that are unexpected. So somehow it knows of this stimulus statistics of natural stimuli and kind of gets rid of everything that's boring and expected. Okay? So that's one way of predictive coding that's happening in the retina. And then there's also even a dynamic version of this. So if you, um, you know, here is a, well, this is actually an, a blank stimulus. And if you, if you adapt the retina to these kinds of stimuli and then measure the receptor fields, it might look like this. So typical center surround. But then if you show lots of vertical stimuli to the retina, you see that the receptive field changes so that it responds less to vertical, so the expected stimulus, and responds more to horizontal, unexpected stimuli, and uh, the other way around. Okay, So this whole predictive coding can happen also on a relatively short time scale, shorter than life. Um, so I think it could also be good um, if, you know, if the assume that the stimulus statistics changes depending on behavioral state, for example, running or not running, if the retina knew about this, it could already um, change its receptor fields or its response properties so that it adapts to those expected stimulus statistics, okay? So this could be one way why this could be a good thing to do, um, to integrate or be modulated by behavioral state. And the other one it's well, being in different behavioral states could mean that different things are relevant to your behavior and you may want to enhance or suppress st specific stimulus features depending on which state you're in. So for example, you might want to increase stimulus sensitivity during quiescence. So you are alerted to, for example, dangerous stimuli, even if you're kind of dozing away. Um, whereas you might increase, want to increase stimulus selectivity when you're alert and really looking for a very specific thing. Okay, so these are kind of the ideas of why this, this might be good. And in the future, I want to look at kind of three, three different um, questions or, or approaches I want to take is looking at the much larger variety of visual stimuli. I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. So in this study, I only use gratings and varied them in, in their direction of movement. But of course, there's lots more parameters we can and should probe to see, you know, where which parameters are modulated or responses to which parameters are modulated and how is the modulation happening in which way basically. And also looking kind of similarly, looking at different functional cell types to see you know, which cell type is modulated in which direction and seeing what different functions those, those cells have could give us a clue of you know, which functions are enhanced and which ones are um, uh, decreased. And of course, also the, the third uh, point is looking at mechanisms. So how is this coming about? How do retinal butons and um, superior clicklist neurons know about behavioral states? And I think, it, as I mentioned before, neuromodulation is a big candidate. So looking into this, I think, will give us a clue how this could be happening and, and also give us more details in what is what is possible uh, to be modulated. All right, and last, at last, I want to thank um, co-authors co on my paper and of course my collaborators, all these people here in my previous lab uh, and also in, in different labs now. And I want to thank uh, my funding um, bodies, um, the EU, Wellcome Trust, BBSLC, and yeah, it was mentioned at the beginning that I just started my lab last month in the University of Sussex. I'm still looking for a PhD student. So if you're interested in these kinds of questions, please get in touch with me. And yeah, I'm also again thanking my funding 
funding bodies here that make it possible for me to do future research on this topic. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And I hope you have lots of questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, indeed, a very interesting uh, topic and talk. Uh, lots to unpack and uh, definitely of uh, crucial nature, the recordings you actually did of the RGC uh, action tracts. Uh, there are already a couple of uh, questions uh, in the chat. And just to remind uh, our audience, like both regular and newcomers, that there will be a short um, discussion like with the questions you post on the chat. And then we will invite you in the very Zoom room that we are currently uh, sitting in for a post-talk uh, informal uh, conversation. Uh, so I will start with the questions like, uh, one is from uh, Luisa Ramirez, but you have already, uh, or maybe at least partially uh, addressed it. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but the question was, uh, biologically, is there a motivation for having inhibition directly in the eye? Uh, it was one of the first outlook points that you made, like why we would already have this effect in the retina. Um, I, like, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. If not, I will proceed with the next. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I can't add a lot because it's just guesswork at this point. But yeah, I agree that this is the most, well, one of the most important questions. Why is this happening? And I'm very, very curious myself. And specifically because we, we have the opposite, mostly the opposite, um, behavior later on in the hierarchy right in the in the primary visual cortex it seems like that the um, neurons are enhanced during arousal or the responses are enhanced so yeah it's it's a very big question and i think we can only answer this yeah with the kind of approaches that i showed um, by looking because maybe we yeah maybe we were unlucky with <laughs> or we are biased by the stimuli that we've shown and actually mm -hmm. for other stimuli it could be different so this has to be kept in mind and we should also not forget that some of those um, retinal boutons there was an increase in activity and yeah the most i think the most important step now is also looking at uh, different cell types and seeing which ones were up, actually up modulated and which were down modulated and and yeah, then I think we have to look at the different stages along the hierarchy and seeing how is, you know, the effect of the retina actually inherited by superior clicklers. So now I, I did these measurements in two different animal sets mm -hmm. of animals, basically. So I think, um, for example, recording at the same time and figuring out what all the different inputs to the neurons actually do. Um, is getting will get us one step closer to the answer of this question but yeah for now i don't know <laughs> yeah uh thank you for that next one up is uh, grace lindsay uh, and she asks the following the correlation between modulation from running and pupil size is surprising as you'd expect a change in pupil size to impact firing rates on its own is the impact of pupil size on activity uh, small Um, I'm not sure I got the question correct. Um, so, so is she, uh, so she thinks that the running speed basically causes the, the fluctuations. So she claims that it's surprising that you have a correlation between uh, the pupil size and the running speed. And yeah. Does that imply that the effect from pupil size uh, on uh, the activity uh, is small? No. Doesn't I mean we? It could be could be both of these things, right? Um, so so how I think about this is there is some brain state which we call arousal, which is affecting the running speed, and it shows up by the changing pupil diameter, and also affects the neural activity, right? So there's. Yeah, this, this vague or this third player called arousal, and we just measure it by running speed and pupil. And yeah, it happens that these two measures, running speed and pupil, are highly correlated. Which one affects activity more? I don't know. And maybe it's, you know, it, it's not one of them directly. I don't think pupil diameter itself causes um, retinal activity to change. I mean, it is important um, in when you have light conditions. So when we show the gratings, 
because of the changing pupil diameter, mm -hmm. there's more or less light coming into the eye. And therefore this could trivially explain changes in responses. But that's why we did also the recordings um, during darkness where you don't have this confound basically. But yeah, as I also mentioned in the talk, we didn't really try to separate between the effects of running and pupil dilation yet because they're so highly correlated. So it's an, it's an open question which whether there is a difference between the effect of running speed and, and pupil. Next one is from uh, Michael Reiser. Uh, the balance of uh, modulatory effects is very interesting. Could it be that the retinal modulation is mainly positive correlation while the effect of arousal modulation in the uh, superior colliculus is mainly suppressive? Uh, so this is about um, comparing the EFIS results versus imaging, right? In the EFIS, we had these nine axons and most of them were actually had a positive correlation. Only two had a negative. Um, I think we, so I guess the question is, you know, is there now a difference because from the EFIS results, we would expect more positive correlations, whereas imaging, we got like a 50-50 correlation. I think the numbers are just too small to make any meaningful statement about this. So I think what we can conclude from the EFIS results, so from the recordings of the axons is simply that something is happening. <laughs> so somehow uh, the activity in the axons and presumably in the cell bodies of the retina, they get information about running speed. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't claim anything about numbers because it's just too, too little. And I think that if you do any kind of test significance tests, it wouldn't hold up to really compare differences in distribution from axons and imaging. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into the exact um, distribution of correlations. Thank you very much. Uh, the last one appearing uh, on the chat is from Kerwick Bayer. Uh, hi, Sylvia, nice talk. You may want to look uh, at uh, cortisol as a modulator. There is evidence from uh, zebrafish that uh, glucocorticoid uh, receptor uh, activation can alter uh, retinal physiology. It's more of a comment uh, and less of a question. Um, That's it. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is at the side of the retina and the cortisol would come from the bloodstream or? I don't Unfortunately, I'm, I will be stepping on thin ground okay. if I attempt to, <laughs> to clarify that, but I'm pretty sure that uh, he can join us in the uh, discussion. Maxim already posted uh, the Zoom uh, room link in the chat, uh, so I will keep uh, the live broadcasting for a couple of minutes more as people start already uh, to join us here in the room. Um, I have one question myself, um, because you also mentioned simultaneously recording from the uh, boutons or from the uh, postsynaptic cells and the axonal tracts. Couldn't you uh, use neuropic and a neuropixel probe uh, properly uh, tilted so you can simultaneously record both from the axons and the uh, superior colliculus or that is impossible to achieve? Well, okay, first of, I guess the, the answer to your question is Yes, you could do this very easily with two probes, right? So the problem is not getting superior colliculus at the same time. It is um, much more of hitting, <laughs> hitting the, red, the optic tract. So I even had two probes kind of trying to hit, you know, the left and the right optic tract at the same time just to increase my numbers, but uh, I wasn't super successful <laughs> even then. Um, so that's not a problem. I. The problem is also, even if you hit both, that you're not, you don't know which of the superior collicular cells is actually getting the retinal input, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so you, you still don't have this one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really the big advantage of the imaging. So what, what we're actually planning to do is having um, dual color imaging of the retinal boutons at the same time as with the different colors of the neurons. Of course, uh, it's still a problem to really know where the synaptic input, which axon is talking to which neuron, 
but I think it will give us a better better clue of what is happening at least at the same time and in the same vicinity at least you know of the retinal input or output <laughs> and the neurons that are listening to it yeah thank you very much for that I see there's a clarification from uh, Grace uh, she says Sorry, I meant that when you change pupil size, you change the light that enters the retina, which would change activity, activity even without top-down uh, modulation. Exactly. So, yes, that's also what we thought. So I, um, we actually did those recordings first. So we recorded first under light conditions. Um, so we recorded the responses to the gratings when this could be a problem. Right, mm -hmm. and therefore we then decided to to introduce the complete darkness condition, where the where you do not change the visual input anymore. Okay, so also I said during complete darkness the pupil size does not change anymore; it's fully dilated. Um, so you're getting around this, and we still see even in darkness um, that the retinal boutons are modulated. So I don't think it's the whole. It's not the whole explanation. Now, yes, I, I think I would just repeat what I said before. I don't think, you know, there is running speed and pupil that are affecting the, uh, these responses, but it's some other third component arousal, which just shows up by these measures, running speed and pupil. Yeah. Now Great. I yeah, I think that... Uh pretty much sums it up from the uh, audience size, uh, side. Uh, I would just like to remind everyone that you can join us in the uh, Zoom room we are currently seated in. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank uh, Sylvia for honoring us and giving a talk about uh, behavioral uh, modulation of uh, visual processing. Uh, and officially now, like before I uh, terminate the live broadcasting, so I will give another couple of minutes so people can join. Uh, I would like to waive my rights as moderator so people who join can uh, freely ask their questions without waiting uh, for my green light, uh, let's say. <laughs> yeah, thanks again for having me. It's really a great seminar series. Yeah. Thanks. So if somebody doesn't want to go ahead with a question, I think I have another one, probably quite naive, I would say, um, because we study, like you study, uh, the effect of behavioral modulation on visual processing. But then again, you do not try to um, influence arousal per se, right? So I was wondering if you can play some more exciting stimuli for the behavioral arousal state to see if there is like an effect of vision on the arousal that comes back to vision again. Ooh. <laughs> like similar to the most exciting images approach that they have, like that they play different images and they try to figure which one triggers the higher responses and then they replay this again. So in a similar context, but behaviorally modulating, uh, including. Maybe yeah. it's really naive and stupid, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely possible. Um, I think the so f from my view, I think this would cause several problems, though, because then it's kind of this loop, and you don't really know anymore what's causing what. So, is it the visual stimulus itself, or is it kind of the the excitement content <laughs> in the stimulus that is acting on the on the neural response? So, so I'm always trying to. Um, separate visual stimulus from behavior. So having the same stimulus under different behavioral conditions or the other way around, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think having these stimuli that always induce a specific um, behavioral state it gets you into problems. But yes, I am thinking about controlling the behavior better by simple things like, for example, having a motorized wheel. So yeah, you can kind of induce running or stop running in the animal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I also want to look at kind of behaviorally relevant stimuli. For example, those, you know, that look more like a predator, the typical looming stimuli that everyone's using now, or 
also stimuli that look like food for the mouse. So it would induce kind of approaching behavior. I think that's that's very interesting, but maybe has already similar problems that I just <laughs> alluded to. <laughs> so if you see, of course, a mouse, if the mouse sees a predator, it probably gets very excited. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of interesting to see what would happen then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I see Simon is here uh, with his microphone on. I don't know, Simon, do you want to go ahead with a question? Yeah, I've got, I've got a question for Sylvia. It was a really good talk and I'm very excited to see that, that people are getting um, responses from ganglion cells in intact behaving animals. Because most of the, as far as I understand it, you might be able to correct me, but as far as I understand it, almost all of the work on the coding of natural images by ganglion cells is done on unnatural ganglion cells because they're in isolated retinas or in their isolated eyes. And so I, my question is, do you see from these very early recordings of yours, which they're the first of their type, I think, are they? Are these? Yeah, well, there is, there is one group that um, managed to record using a kind of elect well, electrode array, putting it behind the eye yeah. They, they uh, were able to record from retinal ganglion cells, but I don't think they, yeah, I don't know how stable it is. So it is kind of a similar measurement with a different approach, which came up uh, around the same time. So my question is, um, is there anything in your, in your data or in your observations that suggests that the ideas about there being a very sparse code and very low firing rates and when gang average fi mean firing rates when ganglion cells are coding um, natural scenes. Uh, is there anything that contradicts that? Because some of your spike rates seem quite high and sustained yeah. even in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was very, I mean, I'm not a retina person by training, so I didn't know much, but I was very surprised to see those high firing rates myself during darkness, yeah. Um, 